Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning. Do you know the, the, the world's longest and oldest wall is which one? The longest and oldest wall in the entire world is none other than the Great Wall of China, right? Um, it has 2,000 years, it is 2000, more than 2,000 years old and it stretches 2,400 kilometers, 5 to 9 meters tall and 5 to 8 meters wide. It is so gigantic that it is said that this is the only man-made structure, the only man-made structure which can be seen with the naked eye from space. Of course, that is a myth. Have you ever wondered how one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is actually a structure of separation. It was built, initially, it was built to protect the people from the invading nomads from the north. But it was also to build, to prevent people from going out. Some walls are built to keep people in, some are built to keep people out. Whether they are built to keep them in or out, walls are not built for unity. Walls are built to separate. Since time immemorial, humans have been separated by walls, visible or invisible. We are separated by language, ethnicity, culture, religion, history, geography, and by many other factors. Verse 14 speaks about a wall, a wall that has been broken down. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Which wall was Paul talking about? He was talking about two specific groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles who had been at odds with each other since the beginning. Although the Jews and the Gentiles had become Christians and members of the church, they still could not tolerate, tolerate each other. They still call other, each other's name. Gentiles would call the Jews the circumcised and the Jews would call the Gentiles the uncircumcised. Gentiles, including us, were seen as, in their eyes, as outsiders, 
outsiders, separated from Christ, um, without the hope of the Messiah. They were at the outcast, alienated from the citizenship of Israel. They were outlaws, not the covenant people. They were outside of God's salvation history, without hope, without God. But, as we said before, the past, the past should not hold us captive. The Bible tells us to remember what Christ had done for us. And we have to change our attitudes, our minds, our behaviors, our hearts, and move on. Look at verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The key phrase here is, but now. But now. Something changed because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus came for us. Remember in the Last Supper, Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant. This is my blood of the covenant. God's covenant is more than an, an agreement between two parties. God's covenant is God Himself laying down the conditions and sealing it with the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Christianity was founded based on this new covenant. And we, the Gentiles, were included in Christianity because of the blood of Jesus. And by the way, Christianity is not a religion of the West. We share the same root of ancient Judaism up to the time of Jesus Christ. We, we share the same salvation history with the ancient Judaism until the time, up to the time of Jesus Christ. You see, the Jewish scriptures is our Old Testament. You must have heard of the phrase of the saying, I am a sinner saved by grace. Right? I am a sinner saved by grace. Perhaps this is also your phrase. But do you agree with that? Do you agree with that statement? I am a sinner saved by grace. The Bible never says that. The Bible instead is telling us to think of something else, to remember what Christ had done for us. The Bible is not asking us to remain sinners saved by grace, to remain sinners saved by grace. By the blood of Christ, you have been saved. You have been brought near to God. You have been brought near to the heart of God. You are a saint saved by grace. You are God's child. You have a new life. You have a new position. You have a new status. No longer are you a sinner saved by grace. Got it? The righteousness of Jesus Christ is in you. The blood of Jesus Christ is in your veins. The gospel story does not end on Good Friday nor was it finished on Easter Sunday. The gospel story continues until today as you live out your life, as you live, up, live out the life of Christ in your life. Yes, you, we, who were far off once, have been brought near, near to the heart of God. Verses 14 to 18 gives us the reason, give us where our confidence is. Verse 14, For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man reckoned in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God 
in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Wow, that is a long sentence, very long sentence. Verses 14 to 18 is like a hymn praising God for how the peace of Christ has brought all of us into one. Notice that in verses 11 to 13, the emphasis is on you, the Gentiles. But here, it is the emphasis is we, us, our Gentiles, Jews, together as one. And there is a progress of thought in verses 14 to 18, step by step, showing, showing the, the breaking down of the wall. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 states that states a fact that the wall had broken down. Verse 15, the law was abolished. And then verse 16, the hostility was killed. Verse 17, peace was preached. Verse 18, access to the Father is granted. And also, in every verse, 14 to 18, the role of Jesus in bringing about this peace is emphasized. Look at verse 14. In His flesh, which is in His death. And then, verse 15. In Himself. In Himself. Not any other people. Verse 16. Through the cross, being cursed. Jesus was being cursed. And in verse 17. He Himself came. Not anyone. And then, finally, verse 18. Through Him not by any other means, but through Him. The word dividing here, the, the word dividing is found only here in the New Testament of all places, only here, which means a, a partition in a building. And also, the word wall refers to a, a fence erected for protection, not for separation. So in other words, if you put the two words together, a dividing wall, actually refers to um, a, a something, refers to something that prevents people from entering. It's something, it is something good, but, but it became a mark, a mark of hostility, like the Berlin Wall, like the Ghetto Wall, uh, like the Iron Curtain, like uh, the, the racial barrier, and etc. Boundaries are important, boundaries are needed, but oftentimes they fail to serve their purposes. A child and his mom were boarding a plane. While the child um, was passing by the first class seats, he quickly jumped on one of those and said, Mommy, I want to sit here. And mommy said, Oh, no, no, this is not your seat. The boy said, why? I, I came first. <laughs> Mommy said, no, boy, this is first class. The son retorted, but I am first in my class. Um, how, how do you explain the class division to a little innocent child? How? You don't have to. Very quickly, he will find out. When the plane is on its way, when the curtain is drawn to separate the two compartments, and the boy will find out instantly. The curtain became a reminder that some are privileged, some are not. During the time of Jesus, the Jerusalem the Jerusalem temple was built on a large plateau called uh, the Temple Mount. And the temple was surrounded by a wall 1.5 meter high separating the temple from the court of the Gentiles. 
and signs in Greek and Latin were posted that read on the wall that read, no foreigner is permitted to pass beyond this barricade around the sanctuary. Whoever does so will be responsible for his own death. Wow, that is very heavy. Gentiles were barred from crossing over into the temple. If they were to cross over, they would be executed. Can you imagine that? The man-made wall served to keep people out, but it had turned into the wall, the dividing wall of hostility. But praise God, this dividing wall has been broken down permanently. Of course, of course, this physical wall is only a symbol of something, of something more significant. It points to a deeper issue. In verse 15, we, we read that Christ abolished this division. Christ abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. What is that? What Christ abolished is not the dividing wall per se or the law itself. What He abolished was the divisive aspect of the law. Let me repeat. The divisive aspect of the law, not the law itself, nor the dividing wall of hostility. You see, the law is good and holy. The law is God's law given to His people, Israel. The law is God's stipulation, uh, the, the stipulation of His covenant. But, but the Jews use it, use the law as a fence to separate them from others. They interpreted it to their advantage and to the disadvantage of others. Jesus came, Jesus came to abolish this divisive aspect, not the law itself. Why? Because Jesus is the purpose, the beginning and the end and the fulfillment of the law. Now, the law of God no longer separates the two. Both the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians can read the law now in light of the gospel of Christ. The peace, the peace Jesus brought about is not primarily for the peace of the individual souls. Not for the individual souls only. Rather, it extends to the social and political arenas. What do I mean by that? You see, God desires peace and unity, reconciliation. God desires justice, peace, reconciliation, which only the gospel could provide. And you notice um, the, 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 the sequence here. If you look at verses 14 and 15, you will notice that Jesus first brought peace between man and fellow man. Not just the Jews and the Gentiles, but man and fellow man. And then, in verses 16 and 17, Jesus brought peace between God and man. Do you see the emphasis here? The emphasis here is on the relationship, on the relationship between man. So men are mentioned first here in the text. And notice again that the idea of both and one, which occurs three times, both one. Look at verse 14. Both one, right? And then verse 16, both in one body. Verse 18, both in one spirit. Do, do you see that? Jesus has created in himself one new man, a new humanity. 
It is not that the Gentiles had converted to Judaism and had become Jews, or the Jews had become Gentiles. No. Jesus reconciled the two enemies and created a totally new humanity. He removed the distinction. He created something the world had never seen, a new paradigm. For the Jews, the fact that the Gentiles were included, were accepted by God into His church, was a complete paradigm shift. It was a miracle. Now, think of this new humanity as a tree, okay? The root of the tree is the law of God. And the trunk, the trunk of the tree is God's salvation history, God's salvation story. The Jews are the branches. The Jews were near to the law, near to the heart of God, while the Gentiles were far off. Now, the Gentiles were grafted into the tree, were grafted into the tree because Christ has abolished the divisive aspect of the law. The two enemies now have to learn to live together because they are now of the same tree. The Jews cannot claim that the tree is theirs alone. They cannot do that. Nor can the Gentiles uh, ask for a new tree when they are grafted into. The two are one together. Two in one. Long before the coffee, two in one, there was already two in one. What is the purpose of this oneness? What is the purpose? Look at verses 19 to 22. So then, you are, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We see a beautiful picture of the church here. What is the church. It is the household of God, verse 19. It is a holy temple, verse 21. It is a dwelling place for God, verse 22. And in this church, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. But I would like to explain a little bit about this cornerstone. This is not the cornerstone at the foundation of a building hidden underground. No, it is the headstone. There are two types of cornerstones in the Bible. Um, one is the foundation stone at the corner, hidden beneath the, the soil. What we are talking about here is Christ being the headstone in the building. He is the final stone, the crowning stone, the, the keystone that is placed last at the entrance, uh, um, at the high, exalted position of the arch. In the center, the highest point of the arch, the gate entering into a city, into a building, that piece of stone is what we call the keystone, the headstone, the crowning stone, the last stone, and Jesus is that stone high and above, prominent, because He is the head of the church. And what about the foundation? The foundation, the foundation of the structure is the New Testament apostles and prophets. And for you and I, we are stones and bricks. 
coming together. You see, you and I, we as a whole, and each of us individually are stones and bricks built together, joined together. We come together. We come together with mutual coordination and support. We come together, we come together, we work together, we play together, we pray together, we worship together, we serve together, we strengthen one another together, we support one another together, and we grow together. Togetherness is the key here. Togetherness, oneness. But the question is this, are we truly together? Are we? Just because the wall has been broken down does not mean that all boundaries have been dissolved. The church still consists of the Jews, still consists of both Jews and Gentiles. Unity does not mean uniformity. And that the killing of hostility does not mean the remover, the remover of identities. We still need to deal with the issue of peace and reconciliation, which is a thorny and perpetual issue in the church. Yes, I agree that humans need boundaries. We need boundaries to define who we are and to define who we are not. We need boundaries to keep us safe and to keep us sane. It is said that good fences make good neighbours, right? My question is, how can neighbours come together if they are divided by fences? Isaac Newton said, we built too many walls and not enough bridges. Why did he say that? You see, scientific advancements and human achievements did not bring in more unity and peace. On the contrary, we only see more division and segregation, conflicts and hatred. According to a report um, in the time, a New York Times uh, in 2003, in the past 3,400 years, humans have been entirely at peace for only 268 years, which is, eight, which is only 8% of recorded history. It is so sad, right? The human history is a history of war. Where is the peace Christ brought and where is the peace Christ preached? You see, today, the issue of division is not very different from the time of Paul, if not more complex. Many people, we see, today we see more new churches sprouting. Not because of church growth, but because of church splits. We see many people moving from one church to another, looking for a better church. And of all places, of all places, the church is the place where many people are hurt. We are together, yet we are not. Walls are built to separate. Bridges are built to connect. When we forget the gospel of Jesus Christ, we rebuild the wall. When we forget that we too need grace, we rebuild the wall. When we forget who we truly are, we rebuild the wall. We need to keep coming back to the cross. Turn our eyes to Jesus because it is in His death that walls are broken down. Um, there is a, a sculpture 
um, in the ruins of St. Michael's Cathedral in Coventry in the UK. It shows um, two ex exhausted figures, a male and a female, kneeling and embracing each other. What is that sculpture all about? As soon as after the Second World War, the sculptor read in a newspaper about a woman who crossed Europe on foot looking for her husband. And when she read it, she was so moved and so touched. So in 1977, she, she made that sculpture and named it Reunion. The husband and wife reunited. And that sculpture was placed in uh, Bradford University. And then, in 1995, uh, that, is, uh, that was the 50th anniversary of the end of Second World War, um, the sculpture was changed, the name was changed from Reunion to Reconciliation. And one of the sculptures was placed in the cathedral, and the other one was placed in, you guess where? Hiroshima, the, the Hiroshima Peace Park in Japan. And, and then, later in 1999, another cast was placed in, in the Berlin uh, Parliament Building as part of the Berlin War Memorial. The sculpture was no longer about the reunion of two people, but a reconciliation of nations. It became a symbol of peace and reconciliation. Today, there is a sculpture in the church, and it is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wars will separate us. The cross, the cross unites us. Church, what we need today is a spirit of reconciliation, not a spirit of interrogation, interrogation or a spirit of accusation. We are children of peace and we are messengers of reconciliation. We are one together and together as one. We don't give up. We don't break up. We don't move out. We work it out. When we focus in reconciliation, all the problems become irrelevant. There is no true reconciliation until we recognize our own errors. There is no true reconciliation until we see others as valuable. There is no true reconciliation until we enter into the pain and tears of others. There is no true reconciliation until we experience the peace of Christ. Wars will separate us, but the cross unites us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for your peace has come upon us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Indeed, there is no true reconciliation until we truly experience the peace of Christ in us. Cause our eyes to turn to Jesus and to Him alone. Cause our hearts to feel the pain and tears of others. Cause our hands to build bridges and not walls so that our lives, our homes and our church will be built into a dwelling place for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.